I invite you to open a Bible to Matthew chapter 25, our gospel reading this morning. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. As we dive into this parable of Jesus and learn what it means to be ready and prepared in our hearts, in our minds, and in our faith for his return, we begin with prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would calm them, comfort them, and encourage them through the word of God this morning. The second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would speak to them and encourage them and uplift them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God and boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So at the end of the church year, we go through the lectionary and see different parables that Jesus tells all about the end and his return because the end of the church year leads into Advent, which is looking forward to Christ, not just his first coming, but his second coming and the hope and the joy that that brings. And so in this parable, Jesus tells us a story of what it looks like for his followers to always be prepared and ready for he, when he will return. And Dr. Gibbs in his commentary on Matthew points out that this is not a story or a teaching about how do we get ready when he comes back, but how do we be ready for when he does return. And there's a big difference between getting ready and being ready. So here's a fun example from my past. When I was in college, my uncle Toby was coming to help me move back from Austin to San Antonio because my parents were busy, and he was, he's a very timely guy, okay? You need to understand my Uncle Toby, he's a software engineer, and so everything needs to be in order, it's got its place, and everything's on time, and he had told me exactly when he would be arriving at my dorm room. Now, the thing you need to know about Pastor Mark is I'm not a timely guy, right? If you've listened to my sermons, you know, they kind of just, well, you know, Wherever the Holy Spirit leads, that's when I say amen, all right? And so my Uncle Toby shows up, and I had a disagreement with him on when he shows up, that's when I'll be getting ready to pack all of my stuff and leave. His expectation was, you will be ready when I get there. Now, we're still friends, all right? <laughs> and he forgave me, because I was, you know, a single guy living in a a little closet of a dorm room, so it took me all of like 30 minutes to pack everything I owned in the whole world at the time. Right? But that's the difference, right? He was upset, he was angry, you know, he eventually forgave me, we're still friends and that's great. But there's a big difference between, oh, I'm getting ready versus I'm actually ready. I, I'm ready to go, I'm, I'm prepared, I am here, everything is ready to go, let's, let's get ready. And so, Jesus tells this parable not so that you and I can figure out, okay, well, later on in life, I can get ready. Later on, I, I, I got time for, so this is the issue that Jesus is addressing. I've got time later on to pack and get ready for Jesus. But at the very end of the parable, we're going to start in verse 13. He says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And throughout many of his parables and teachings, Jesus emphasizes this point for his followers that we don't know when he is returning. So he doesn't want us to live with the attitude of, I can get to the things of God, I can get around to the things of Jesus later in, on in life. I can get ready later. He's emphasizing, no, you need to be ready at all times in the faith because you don't know when he is going to call you home or when he is going to return. So we go into it in verse uh, 1 of chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And so the first thing that we do to be ready is a church word called repent. 
Throughout the scriptures, repentance has to do with being wise or foolish. And according to Proverbs, wisdom begins with having faith in God and foolishness. The fool is the one who says there is no God in their heart. And so to be ready begins with repentance of, am I living wisely according to God's word? Am I living with him at the center of my life? Is he my main priority? Or do I got a stack of things I want to get around to first, and I'm just banking on the idea of later on I can get around to the things of God and to the things of Jesus? Now, here's the reality. Jesus is addressing both kinds of people in this parable. He says there's 10 virgins. They're all waiting for Jesus. They're all waiting for the bridegroom. And yet, only five of them are wise and are ready, and the other five are foolish. They are not always going to be ready. They're going to be able to say, I'll get to it later. And so the first step in you and I being ready is to follow the teachings of Jesus in terms of repenting and following his ways. In Matthew chapter 7 of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells it this way, that those who hear his word and build their lives on his word are wise people like one who builds a house on a rock so that it can survive the storms of life. And then he says, the foolish person is the one who hears my word. So everybody's heard his word in the parable. But instead of building their life on his words, they build their life on their own ways. And instead, it's like a person who builds a house on shifting sand. So when the storm comes, guess what happens, Jesus says. The house falls apart. The life falls apart. And this is what Jesus describes to us throughout the Gospels is what it looks like to be wise versus foolish is, am I a person who builds my life on his word and emphasize him as my main priority in life and my faith? Or am I building my life on everything else and Jesus is just a little compartment of the house? He's just a little piece of it on the side. So this is a very convicting passage. Jesus wants us, because he loves us, to be wise. He wants us to be ready. So it begins with repentance. And then he goes on in the story in verse 5, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept, right? So no one's really awesome in this story, right? They're like, okay, the bridegroom's going to come any minute. And he says, no, even the wise people fell asleep. Everybody became drowsy and fell asleep because he was delayed. Now, here's the deal. I know many of you love the Lord and you love Jesus, but I've also counseled and prayed with many of you over the reality that sometimes God is delayed in acting the way you want him to act, correct? You ever said a prayer and then took a while for it to get answered or didn't get answered the way you wanted? or you were hoping for something and it was delayed and it was pushed off and pushed off and pushed off, and then did you get frustrated with God? Did you, did you fall asleep and get a lot of drowsy in your faith and go, well, I've tried that? And that's what happens. The bridegroom is delayed, and the temptation is to what? Get drowsy, fall asleep, and say, well, I'll, I'll try, I tried that. When, when he comes back, I'll, I'll be ready. Yet... What he wants us to do as the wise people is to listen to his word. And by listening to his word, we can trust in his word and in his promises. So the first step to be, being ready is to repent. The second step is to being ready is to trust his promises. Right, first Peter says that he's not delayed in the way that we think some things are delayed, because he says a, a thousand years is like a day to God but he is compassionate in his delaying because he wants more and more people to be ready, more and more people to come to faith. And in John uh, chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, Jesus says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. This is what it looks like to be ready and trusting God's promises. We hear his word, so we listen to the voice of Jesus, we listen to his word, we build our lives on it, and even though it seems like he is delayed, and from our perspective, we go, but I can trust in his promises. And so I follow him each and every day knowing he is the one who gives eternal life. 
The other option, according to Jesus, is you listen to the voice of the devil. And that's what he's talking about in John chapter 10. He's talking about his voice versus the voice of the devil. And when we listen to the voice of the devil, we get into all kinds of problems, all kinds of issues, that we, all kinds of destruction. And the house that we build our world on, our lives on, begins to fall apart. But Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, and they hear it. And I'm the one, not anybody else, but Jesus is the one who gives eternal life. And so we want to trust in his promises. This is how Luther defined faith for us. He says it's someone would trust in the promises of God a thousand times over and stake their lives on it every time. That's the definition of faith. That I hear the word of God, I hear his promises, and I trust in them. Because it can be difficult when things are delayed. It can be difficult when we know the promises of God and we haven't yet experienced all of them yet, or we're waiting for them to be fulfilled, right? This passage is all about the return of Christ, and in the return of Christ, Revelation promises that he will wipe away every tear, get rid of all grief, sorrow, mourning, and sadness, and he will get rid of death itself. That's a beautiful promise, which is why Jesus, right after he makes that promise, says, write these words down because they're trustworthy and true. But he hasn't come back yet. And so in the meantime, while there's this delay, guess what there is in life? There's tears, and there's sorrow, there's sadness, there's death, there's sickness. There's all kinds of things that the enemy uses to attack us and bring us down and tear us apart and rip our lives apart. Yet Jesus is saying, but don't, don't let your lamp go out. Don't give up because I am trustworthy and true. My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and I love them, and I'm going to give you eternal life. And so we repent, we turn and build our lives on God's word, we trust in his promises, and then the third thing that we do is we trust in his love. So here's the rest of the story. But at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. So he shows up. He was delayed, some people fell asleep, but what did Jesus do? He showed up and he kept his promise. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And then while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. So Jesus eventually shows up. He keeps his promise that he has made throughout his word to give eternal life to his bride, to the church, to you and me. And he invites us into the marriage feast of the Lamb. Now here's the deal. Why did I say you gotta trust his love? Jesus does this out of love. This whole parable is wedding language. Throughout his teachings, Jesus often uses wedding language to kind of describe how much he loves his children, how much he loves us as his bride. In John chapter 14, we see another example of this that you're a little more familiar with. So I'm going to combine the two of them. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to a place to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that you, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Now this is a very famous passage. Eventually Thomas asked the question, well, where are you going? How do we know the way? And Jesus famously says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But I want you to see in both of these teachings, both of these parables, is that Jesus is using a first century wedding language. So what would happen is when the couple became betrothed, did my mic go out? No, okay. My ear went out then, all right. (laughs) When the couple became betrothed, uh, they would get together in the village and then the, the groom, the future groom would go back to his father's house and he would add on additions, he would add rooms onto it 
and prepare a place for him and his future bride and their family to dwell and live together. Except for he doesn't know when he's done. He's only done when the father tells him he's done and can go get the, get the bride. And the bride, likewise, would go away and she would get prepared to what it means to be a wife and all the things that came with that and, and all the homemaking and everything else that they did back then for her. And then she would also, the whole time, keep a lamp lit in her window so that the groom would know which house to go to. And when the father finally said, it's done, everything's complete, the place is prepared, the groom would leave and there would be a processional with the father and the son all the way through the village to where the bride is with the lamp lit, and then they would be joined together and they would go together to the feast. So when Jesus tells these two parables, he's saying, I want you to understand how much I love you, how much I care for you, how much Jesus wants to be with you forever. He says, it's like a groom who's madly in love with his bride. And when the time is ready, when the father says, okay, the rooms are ready, I'm gonna come and take you to be with me and we're gonna enjoy this feast and we're gonna enjoy being together for all eternity. And so he tells this parable in Matthew 25, not to scare us, but to encourage us to be ready, to understand, no, he has loved us with a perfect love. Through his death on the cross, he has forgiven all of our sins. Through his resurrection, he has conquered death. He has told us and shown us, see, I am capable and will keep all the promises I've ever made to you including coming back to take you to be with me forever. So his hope and prayer for you and my hope and prayer for you is that you would be ready, that you would not put faith off to the end, that you would not put Jesus off as a side compartment of your life, but instead you would build your life on his word and on his teachings, that throughout your daily life you would trust in his promises, and that each and every day you would trust in his love for you, that he loves you with a perfect love, and will take you to be with him for all eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you love us with a perfect love. We give thanks that you are a God who keeps your promises, and that one day you will return to bring us home to be with you forever in heaven. We thank you for this gracious salvation that you give to us through your death and resurrection. We thank you for your love. In your name we pray, amen.